Coming up, funds from the CARES Act is put towards a new mural in Rapid City, South Dakota. We'll meet the artist. Plus, tribes dealing with hurricanes and forest fires. We'll get a Washington update from John Tasuda. I'm Patty Tholohungva. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from Indian Country Today. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. ASU offers the only online undergraduate digital media literacy degree, teaching students how to recognize and combat inaccuracies on all platforms. They are using cutting edge tools and tactics to separate fact from fiction in a digital world overloaded with misinformation. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. Is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tholohungva. The Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians in Michigan is joining the state's recreational cannabis market. Its new tribal ordinance regulates the commercial cultivation, processing, and distribution of marijuana and marijuana products. Due to the pandemic, the tribe suffered a huge decline in revenue at its resort and two casinos. Benzinga.com reports the tribe began researching the cannabis industry after the state legalized it. Tribal chairman David Arroyo says revenue will be used to help tribal programs. When you look at the success of the cannabis in industry so far, and you know, we're hoping that we can uh, have some other means of uh, supporting tribal programs. I, I, I hope someday eventually we could expand housing, maybe perhaps uh, expand health care. The chairman says the tribe is moving slowly, but is looking to open a retail dispensary in the near future. To preserve their traditions, one band of Wampanoag in Massachusetts is working to save a living part of tribal history. For thousands of years, the return of the herring was a sign of spring for the people. The fish that were central to the Aquina Wampanoag tribe of Martha's Vineyard are now scarce. A study is being launched by the tribe's Natural Resources Department to look at the spawning habitats and life cycles of the fish. According to the Boston Globe, the tribe hopes to learn more about what can be done to help them rebound. The federally funded two-year study signals a growing push to tap the knowledge of Native people in environmental research. Alaska Natives are continuing to push to stop a massive copper mine. For nearly 20 years, plans to mine near the world's largest sockeye salmon fishery have faced opposition. Now, an Alaska Native group is preparing to give up development rights to nearly half of its land along a key area near the Pebble Mine. The Alaska Native village, Pedro Bay Corporation, is ready to place part of its territory out of reach of development for good. The agreement prohibits industrial development on an important corridor for the open pit mines operations. The deal is still conditional on the nonprofits raising $20 million by the end of 2022 to compensate the corporations for not developing its lands. In an effort to heal from some of California's racist history, indigenous communities held a ceremony last Saturday to mark the removal of a Christian mission bell. Native Americans from across the state came to speak in support of the removal of the final bell from the city of Santa Cruz. The bell was actually stolen hours before the ceremony took place, and police are looking for the suspect. The bells were part of the Spanish Franciscan mission system, and according to the state's Native American Heritage Commission, one third of the indigenous population died as a direct result of this system. The bells controlled when the Indians at the mission could eat, sleep, and pray, and natives who did not obey were punished. The chairman of the Amamutsin tribe, Valentin Lopez, says they were very happy other tribes in the state accepted their invitation to join them. And we were very pleased with, this, uh, with, the, um, with the response we got. We had tribes coming from um, San Diego, Los Angeles, um, the central part of California, a lot of tribes from the central um, from the central coast of Calif from the um, San Francisco Monterey area. The chairman says his tribe will now focus on getting the other 500 bells removed from the state. 
Walking Eagle News is using native humor to lighten the load, skewer politicians, and raise awareness about some serious issues. The satirical news site first began as a comedy project for the Anishinaabe citizen Tim Fontaine in 2017. Their headlines speak to the tense relationship between indigenous peoples and po police and Canada's political discourse. The editor and grand chief says the headlines and social media posts are an extension of Indian country's ability to tease. I know I'm on pretty good ground if I go into community and as a guest, and people start teasing me or, or, or joking around or laughing, right? I think that's a really good sign. So, I mean, there's something about that in our communities and that's reflected in Walking Eagle News. Fontaine says to get ready because coming this fall, they will be broadcasting a news radio show. And those are the headlines for Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Thalohungva. Coming up, a new public art project is unveiled in Rapid City, South Dakota. And later, we'll talk politics with John Tasuda. Stay with us. CARES Act funding provided relief in many different ways, including the creation of a mural in Rapid City, South Dakota, through the state's Arts Council. The leadership from Racing Magpie, which is an artist studio, commissioned an Oglala artist to create the mural that's 25 feet tall and 40 feet wide. Michael Tubles is an Oglala Lakota artist and a member of the musical group The Wake Singers, and he's a printer at Pajunta Press. Welcome, Michael. Hello, thank you for having me. Well, congratulations on your mural here. And uh, talk a little bit about how it came together because it was a little bit of a community effort. Yeah, so we had two um, workshops um, centered around community. So the ask was to have Ocheti Shakui relatives uh, attend that. And uh, out of those two workshops, we, as Pajuta Press, um, took all the notes and and, and filtered it through um, through the lens of mostly my I guess my aesthetic of painting and everything and and that was the result yeah and they they also worked under conditions in this COVID environment uh, what was that like and and what did you have to keep be mindful about when it you brought people together for this mural um, so the um, the workshops were one was in person that was obviously tough because everyone had to be masked and the other was virtual um both both workshops yeah i mean that was a heavy subject that we tackled and analyzed together so there was a lot of fruitful things coming from it and then how did that come out in the mural itself so describe that mural and some of the symbolism attached to it sure so um <clears throat> The ask from Magpie was pretty general around COVID the year. So once examining it, we, we've kind of talked about other root issues that are happening in and around Rapid City or Mini Luzaho to Wahe. So that the um, concept of the mural jumped around to different things of, of uh, bigger issues that, that are around in and around this area. So give us an example. So when you look at the mural, you see in the background an alphabet and capital letters. So the approach was layered. So every every layer kind of consisted of different elements. So the very first layer was actually done on um, doing repetition alphabet. And that was sort of a, a take on language and what 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 we want to do and what what's becoming of it. So a, a lot of it was very layered. Um, so that was one of many kind of things that was happening conceptually in the mural. And then what do the DNA strands uh, symbolize for your group? Well, I, I added the DNA strand to to remind indigenous people, uh, Cheti Shakui relatives, that we are from the land and that that's blood memory. And that's with us regardless of where we are. So that was also just a a, a reminder for for Chetishagui relatives in and around the area. 
Did you have a lot of discussions about that, about your connection to the place? Very much so. I mean, these these workshops were so fruitful, and I mean, they were tough to to really take and and analyze and and look at. And one of the big things that one of the foundational asks was to think about indigenous past, present, and future. So even that subject alone was so huge and encompassing that we tackled so much. It was it was pretty extensive. Uh, the workshops to 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 even draw from. Um, and one one major thing that we kind of discussed was, you know, like us usually in this area in Hesapa area, it's a major major economic tourism, you know, like foundation. So what is the question was around? What does that mean for indigenous people since tourism is read relied heavily upon? So one of them was like maybe we don't want to be condemned to the past anymore, like romanticized into the past. So, so a lot of it was not for tourist or settler gaze. Uh, it was intended for indigenous people. And so when uh, maybe a non Lakota person looks at this mural, um, what do you think they'll take away when they see it? Well, that was not at the forefront of the question of the mural, but now that I've considered it, there was a lot of concern around it um, and how settlers would look at it and, and see it. And, and there was a, a very real fear of coming to it, coming back to the mural, you know, um, maybe damaged because of the just the climate here ar around, you know, just politically, um, socially. So it, it, it's a very, very real question that we all talked about consistently. And have those fears been confirmed or what's been the reception? Well, I mean, uh, for the most part, it's been positive. I mean, that's 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 really the intention and, and, and a lot of great feedback. So during this process, I reached out to a very dear friend, um, uh, Lori Puyer, who, who offered the words that are, that are at the bottom of the mural. And it says, uh, we are becoming what will become of us, Inaji. Inaji means rise or to stand up. So the invitation is that we're always becoming, right? We're always in a state of becoming. It's just what will become of us. So the invitation is to take action and whatever that means to you. That's really fascinating because, you know, when we think about our people and where we are in this world and where what we, are we becoming, Many of us are now living in urban areas, away from traditional homelands. So, how do you take that uh, being of you know being Lakota to Phoenix, Arizona, or to Los Angeles? You know, or you know, for me, I'm Hopi. So, how do I carry that with me? Um, how do you do that? Well, I think there's a lot of old tropes um, that are being dispelled now, like the division of urban and native res, or urban and reservation natives so that split was not you know is caused by you know reservation being put there right so here now there's a, a uptick of population of native people moving here because of no jobs on the reservation so causing a housing crisis right so a lot of those things are real so we want to dispel those those old tropes of divisionist kind of ideas uh, of urban and res versus no, we all are one, right? So that's also kind of talking about some of those ideas in the mural. All right, and color, the use of color is so important and, and I'm sure you had a lot of thought as to what colors um, and how bright the shades are. Talk a little bit about that. Yes, um, and like I said, I, I took the mural and put it into my own aesthetics. Um, so my paintings are very layered and a lot of color. And the idea behind that was to invite the viewer or the audience to, you know, look look at it longer because it's it's very colorful. It's you want to look at it right away and a lot of things are happening. So that 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 is more of a technique of like inviting the viewer to come in to see it. Um, on the level of visually aesthetically pleasing with all these colors so it's 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 a little it's like an artist kind of technique that i've used throughout the years i suppose 
Well, it's, it's really um, quite magnificent, and I can't, you know, imagine just standing in front of it because it's so large, you know, the wall there. And, um, and it's on the side of the building that's uh, new, and so Racing Magpie now has a new home. Uh, what do you see as the future of that for the community? Uh, a new home, a new mural, new energy perhaps? Yeah, so it's a new, yeah, it's a new building. Um, I think new ideas are, are being circulated, so they're not officially open yet, but throughout the years I've had um, supported them in various ways and also I've had studios at their places in the past um, to function. So even at that, that idea of having Native artists come together in community together is such a big role in this area that's, uh, you know, like not, not present really. All right. And before we let you go, uh, you come from a family of artists. You, uh, you have generations of artists who have all contributed uh, to your community there. Talk a little bit about your family and, and actually the exhibit that you guys all put together recently. Right. Yeah. So um, I, I come from a, a long line of artists um, in the family and, um, you know, in various degrees, you know, like different mediums, you know, I mean, I think my uncles and my aunts, grandparents, they, they all are different artists. And, and seeing that growing up, uh, you know, like I've been witness of that and, and um, active participant in, in the native art world, I suppose um, one could say, but also one could say um, the tourist art trade and what that means. Um, and, 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 and I'm always going back to that and reflecting on it because, you know, spending a lifetime doing that and also seeing your family doing that, one analyzes that as an artist and, and examines it. <laughs> Certainly there. Uh, what are you working on right now? Currently we're, um, as you can see, we, we're, we do side projects um, with, with Pajuta Press and to keep the press running, we do like other gigs, you know, so right now I'm running some sweatshirts for, for a local company. All right. Well, we'll continue to follow your artwork and also your family's artwork here. Thank you so much for joining us today, Michael. Any last quick mention you want to say? Yeah, I just wanted to um, shout out a few of the people that helped big time was um, um, uh, uh, Tusuecho Mendoza, um, who, who was a young young person that really helped us in the project and the process of doing it and also like collaborating. Um, and also my cousin Reed Tubles and Douglas Tubles who, you know, were there every day. <laughs> so just wanted to shout them out. Very good. Well, thank you again, Michael. Thank you so much. And when we come back, we'll catch up with John Tasuda. Tribes are reeling from hurricanes and forest fires and soon flooding and other natural disasters. What kind of emergency funding can they expect? Joining us today is John Tasuda III. He's a regular contributor to Indian Country Today and has many years of experience working with the Senate Indian Affairs Committee, as well as being a former Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs. Today, he is a partner with Navigators Global, which is a company that provides political services to several industries, including tribes. Welcome, John. Thanks, Patty. Thanks for having me this morning. Can you believe it's September 1st already? Uh, 2021 has zoomed by. It has. Uh, summer went by. Um, you know, we've been very busy uh, at the same time in partial lockdown. So I think that contributed to a, a summer that seemed like it was about two weeks long. <laughs> exactly. And we're still in this uh, uh, pandemic era. Uh, and yet we're seeing tribes starting to come together and have events and people are traveling. Uh, we're still dealing with the pandemic. And now on top of that, we have these natural disasters. Uh, currently, Hurricane Ida, you know, has just devastated the Gulf Coast area with lots of tribes there, uh, many of them being state recognized. And then we have fires burning in California around Lake Tahoe. Uh, let's start with just emergency funding. What can tribes expect in terms of emergency funding from this administration? 
Well, I, you know, every administration really makes it a priority to deal with uh, natural disasters, et cetera. There are, uh, you know, there are a lot of authorities that the administration has to tap into different funds uh, to create a common pot for dealing with uh, emergency situations, disaster relief, et cetera, in the short term. In the long term, uh, you know, Congress has always been pretty good about funding, you know, support for uh, disaster relief, et cetera, in the longer term. And so you have you have several pots that are short term, and, but then eventually Congress needs to enact uh, special funding to deal with, you know, a particular national disaster, a natural disaster uh, that would provide funding. Usually it takes several years to recover from these things. And so Congress will need to do that. But they've been historically, they've been very good at that. Well, in Louisiana, we have a situation where there are a number of state tribes, which, of course, without that federal recognition, they don't have access to the federal funding. Uh, however, there are federally recognized tribes that in the past have helped them out. Uh, what are you hearing on that front uh, in terms of this hurricane and the recovery efforts there? Well, I, I, you're, you are correct. Uh, the, the tribes generally band together and, and they don't they don't consider whether one is federally recognized or not. They, they you know, kind of reach out uh, in a common bond and help each other. And they've done that uh, you know, historically. And, and uh, I'm sure that they will do it this time. I know that they contribute to, as soon as they deal with the situation on their on their reservation, they reach out and try to help others. Um, there's a lot of um, equipment uh, that's needed to deal with these. And tribes traditionally are very um, you know, helpful to each other. Uh, in, in helping to provide equipment. Um, they also, um, a lot of people don't know this, but a lot of tribes from other parts of the country actually send assistance uh, to tribes in these areas that are hit with disasters. And so from say Oklahoma or Arizona, you'll get uh, you know, uh, uh, disaster relief from the tribes there to come out and help. Uh, you flip the wildfires, you'll have uh, uh, tribal firefighters that will travel all over the country to help in particular situations. And so. Tribes have always done that well, reached out to help each other, including the state recognized tribes. Um, and, and FEMA does a good job now of, of uh, generally working with the tribes and, and uh, they, they often don't distinguish in a disaster. They don't distinguish you know, whether it's a federal or a state recognized tribe. Uh, they start providing relief in those areas and trying to help folks out. We had um, the principal chief of the uh, United Home Nation on the other day, August Krippel, and he talked about uh, just describing the devastation there, and he said it looked like a bomb went off. And they're saying that this damage here to, uh, from Ida is worse than what they experienced with Hurricane Katrina 16 years ago. Yeah, you know, every, you know obviously every hurricane kind of makes a, a point of entry onto land in a slightly different place. And, and uh, it looked like from the maps uh, as the hurricane was, was making landfall that uh, folks like the Homa folks are going to be right in the, you know, the thick of it. And, and uh, so uh, I'm sure they're, they're dealing uh, with a lot right now. Um, I know that uh, the tribes uh, in that area are, are helping each other, but there's um, you know, a lot of people without power. It makes it very difficult. I have to say, though, um, you know, I have several family members uh, from Oklahoma who uh, work for electricity companies. And uh, they're, they're actually, they, they headed there a couple of days ago to Louisiana to help with restoring power, et cetera. So uh, again, you know, the, these really kind of turn into regional and even national uh, assistance efforts. So we'll see, we'll follow that story. And then uh, the other big story that's making headlines now is the uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan. Um, you know, was there ever a good time to withdraw? A lot of people are looking at that and saying, what's going on? And, you know, there are still Americans there. There are. Um, you know, and to, to our community specific, I, I haven't heard whether there are any Native Americans that are uh, among the, the group of Americans that are still there. I wouldn't be surprised, though, um, you know, that there are some. Uh, we, have a lot of, we have a lot of folks, uh, you know, from the tribes that, can, that uh, participate in some of the relief organizations internationally. Uh, and so uh, I, I think we should all say prayers for those folks and their families. And uh, so, I, you know, that, that is something that hopefully will be ongoing. I know the president has made a commitment to do that. Um, I think Congress will probably, uh, given, given the, you know, the, the, the way that it unfolded and the attention that's been nationally, I'm sure Congress and the president are going to be focused on that uh, for, for a while. And so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a difficult situation in any way you look at it. And um, 
besides the people there serving in different capacities, I was also wondering, because of the high rate of, of service, you know, by Native Americans in the military, you know, how many Native troops are, are involved in this uh, evacuation plan? Have you heard anything on that front? I, I have not heard anything specific. Um, you know, in general, uh, they don't really let people uh, know, you know, when they're deployed in those kinds of areas, obviously to protect the information of, of our servicemen that are over there, et cetera. So we'll probably find out uh, later and, you know, in the, in the next year or two as, as, as things unfold and the troops have come back home and they're not in immediate danger like that, we'll probably find out more information about who was deployed there. All right. Um, and one quick mention on the voting rights. What's the latest when, can we expect when they come back to session, the House? Well, as, uh, as you know, the House passed a massive voting rights uh, uh, bill that would change the, the current law. Uh, there's a specific tribal voting rights bill that uh, Congressman uh, Sharice David, or Congresswoman Sharice Davids and Tom Cole passed. Um, parts of that are in there, and you know, we can hope that that stays in the legislation. All right. Well, thank you so much, John Tasuda. Thank you, Betty. And thank you for watching. Uma umu katsi u'kalyani. Take care of yourselves. Your life is precious. I'm Patty Talohungva. Join us again tomorrow. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. This is Indian Country Today.